Rose. I go live and I can see lists of names of people coming through already. We will give it a couple of minutes just as everyone uh, logs on. Just have a flick through some names already. Jane, Richard, Hillary. Uh, good evening. So we'll uh, just uh, say we're just waiting on a, a few minutes, and, uh, and we shall get underway once uh, everybody's uh, logged in. If you've been on one of these, uh, if you've listened to one of our webinars before as well, just we'll uh, we'll do an audio check. So uh, if you're able to raise your hand, uh, if you know how that function um, works at the minute, thank you, Hillary. Hillary, yes, brilliant, good. You can all hear it, Ian. Yeah, great. I can see it's all uh, all working through there. That's good. It's a good start. It's always good if people can hear you. Right, so just expecting a few more people that have uh, obviously registered through, so we'll give it another couple of minutes. Oh, another few seconds, and then we'll get started. Yeah, another couple more just uh, just joined us through, but uh, we will see how uh, how they come through as we go. Uh, thanks, Jane. Yeah, the question all, all work. The question system's working as well. So thanks, Jane, for sending that one through. Brilliant. Um, we'll get started on introductions, um, and then that can obviously we'll give uh, everybody else a little bit more time to to join us. It is uh, seven o'clock by um, nine o'clock. Seven o one. We've gone to nine at the minute, so uh, we will get started. Um, so thank you for uh, for joining us uh, again this evening. This is our fifth webinar of uh, of twenty nineteen. So it's great to have you joining us. Um, eight overall with, our, with the pilot ones we did last year, and um, still getting lots of uh, lots of views at the moment. All the sessions, um, and uh, a bit of a plug for um, national volunteer and coaching weeks that are coming up. And um, all the previous uh, webinars that this year will be going onto our YouTube channel, um, so they'll be able to access it through there as well. Um, for those that haven't logged on um, before. Um, my name is Peter Brook, uh, England Development Officer for British Orienteering, and um, alongside me this evening, uh, you'll see uh, on the video, um, is Jenny Betridge, uh, Strategic Volunteer Lead at Sport England. Jenny? Hiya, good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me, this is an absolute pleasure. Oh, brilliant, good, good. So, uh, anything anything you want to, to add before we kick off? Kick off? Oh, okay. Um, a bit of introduction to me. Uh, as Peter said, I'm Strategic Lead for Volunteering at Sport England. Um, my own personal background is in um, kind of community organising and mobilisation. I come from, from politics, uh, 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 which is a bit unusual, but um, I have a um, often not aired uh, love relationship, love hate relationship with volunteering, having grown up in an army family background where my dad did it the whole way through my childhood. So I have um yeah memories of getting changed in car parks uh usually being wet and cold um being bribed with a mars bar that sold out the back of someone's car um so you know really really delighted to be here with you this evening and i know the huge amount of work that you guys put in to help make volunteering happen so that's a little bit about me excellent Brilliant. so um as the webinar program is is for everybody so uh, you can ask questions throughout i will show you how in a moment um and it's just to say for you likewise if there is a topic that you want to hear um then do let us know um these topics are for you uh, everything has been shaped um uh, every topic has been uh, organized by what you fed back to us um following the week webinar as well you'll um receive an email um with a link back to the recording so if you wish you can watch it back uh, you can watch all of it or some of it back if you want to uh, refresh your memory as well um and like i said do ask questions uh, as we uh, as we progress so how can you get involved if you are new to this 
Um, we have a, uh, an easy question uh, box that you can send your question in. So if you do, just ask a question. You'll see this is a snapshot I've, uh, I've taken um, of my screen. On the top right, you'll have a orange uh, box with a white arrow in. If you just click that, that will expand another box and you'll see there's a, a question box in there. You just type your question away and uh, it will pop up and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, do keep them coming. Um, we will answer them as we go. And uh, yeah, hopefully they will, uh, we will answer your question. So our session tonight, a um, couple of key headings on there, but volunteering is a, is a key topic within clubs across the country, um, but also a factor within sports and other community groups. Um, should all know the crucial roles um, volunteers play in the sports. We're not going to be concentrating on the individual roles tonight. Um, we're going to be looking at why people volunteer, how they volunteer, and, and what can we do within clubs to embrace uh, and grow our volunteer workforce. And um, we'll have some good practical examples as well. Uh, and let's uh, obviously do get in touch. I um, really want to hear about any um, specific examples you've got or experiences um, as well. Um, we might not, we certainly won't have all the answers uh, or a magic formula tonight, but hopefully uh, we can provide some really good uh, tips and ideas that you'll be able to adapt from your club. Um, the feedback we've had so far on other webinars has been that it's it's really helped to generate discussion um, and push people um, on to try new things. And that, that is the whole purpose, um, purpose of this programme. Um, we've also been sent a few questions in early doors as well. Um, so we've factored a couple of them in tonight as well. Um, and, and a few polls uh, to get, uh, get you involved as well straight away. So we're actually going to go um, straight with uh, a poll question. So let me just get this. Uh, all set up. So before we go on to the next slide, we'll have a poll. So hopefully that is uh, on the screen now. So how do you first get involved in volunteering for your club? Um, so if you give a few, give you a few seconds, a uh, minute or so to uh, to answer that. Um, yeah, responses coming through already. I can see them coming in. Uh, two that are taking the uh, that are taking the lead by some distance, and three that not so much. Um, but it's really just helped to give us a good idea about how you uh, how you first got involved. Um, as I said the simplest and most obvious uh, are often the best. But we will see what um, what people say as you uh, as you get involved. I think we've got the majority of people have, uh, have answered that. So I will uh, let me close that down and I will share that. That should come up on that. Um, quite emphatic, 70-30, I think. Um, Jenny, what do you think about that? Is that about um, what you'd expect as well? Yeah, absolutely. This is what we're seeing across uh, sport, which we'll come on to a little bit later. Some of our greatest strengths is that we have a really close social network of people that we're involved in and actually asking for help uh, and being people volunteering in that respect is, is a really strong thing. Again, word of mouth being known around that actually help is needed and then putting yourself forward. However, and we will come on to this a bit later, actually, what is the role of technology and how can we create that same kind of impact that we have on that connectedness and that community and social side, but also using other tools so that we can actually spread the ask and get more people involved and they still feel like they've been asked directly or that they're still connected to the club. Yeah, brilliant. Right, let's uh, get back onto the uh, onto the uh, slides. Uh, so we've got the first of the questions that have um, come in as well. So do um, feed, you, feed us this, uh, your thoughts back as well. Um, uh, and let us know if you've um, face this situation before as well. So um, one of the challenges that for many clubs is that they have a small band of uh, volunteers who suffer from fatigue and burnout. So it can be a vicious circle. Uh, getting started as to grow volunteers takes time and effort. Um, any strategies to getting around this and preventing this becoming an issue? So do let us know, have you faced this? How have you addressed it um, in the past? So it's always a tricky one that will We'll always take some extra time, um, but it'll be beneficial down the line and trying to explain that to people um, as well. And uh, just to say that you know, it'll take time, 
but it'll, the end goal will be a beneficial, um, certainly. But, um, and, and setting out a plan, and we'll be looking at other bits, um, and hopefully addressing that in much more detail later on. Um, is there anything that jumps out to you at the minute, Jenny, on this one? Um, I guess just to reassure you guys that actually you're not alone, that you could almost take any sport, and in fact, I'd even go so far as any community organisation or church faith group, actually, that often you do rely on a small band of volunteers who, oh, you know, almost incrementally don't realise as things build up and that they're doing more and more. And at the same time, we also know how hard it is to bring people in um, or even think of small specific ways that you can invite people to start giving their help. So uh, first off, don't, you know, don't, don't worry, you're not alone in this, but actually it is taking that long view and it's also helping everyone feel like they're part of the answer and the solution. So actually it is lots of little asks and it is about kind of almost sometimes putting your hands up and saying there's lots going on here. So we really need to look after our existing volunteers, but also let's share that load and let's kind of create that, that larger pool of people that we can, we can use to support you. Yeah, we'll move on a look at uh, what is volunteering. So what is volunteering? A um, couple of pictures on there and uh, it says people uh, oh, um, from uh, from PFO just in there. That's a, a series. I'm going to touch on an example from PFO um, shortly um, as well. If you are tuned in, so it was one of the questions from um, uh, previous uh, previous webinars, PFO, Pendle Forest Orienteers, um, if you're not uh, up to speed with some of these, um, or from outside the UK, because we have a few people from outside um, watching these. So sorry if I go into a couple of acronyms, I will try and remember to explain uh, which ones they are. Actually, just before we um, move on, we do have um, a couple of questions. Um, uh, Hilary Quick, so I think it's uh, also risky for the club to allow a small band to be consistently doing the majority of work, so the stalwarts can be seen as, uh, as a cliche, also the club becomes dependent on them, and when they move away I'll just call it a day, there's no one else to take it over, yeah, yeah, that's uh, certainly not alone uh, there as well, um, and Carol, we'll just go on to this one, so as a previous club, um, with membership secretary, uh, once new people have joined and been uh, members for a few months, uh, she contacts them um, uh, which team they wanted to be in. So there's car parking, registration, start, finish, control. It was assumed that everyone would become a member of a team. So um, that will be um, splitting up the members within your club into separate smaller teams that got involved in different roles. So uh, that was good. Some uh, some good questions uh, there. But we'll start to have a look at obviously volunteering a bit more detail um, and then how we can get people to obviously volunteer. So when we look at bon the question, what is volunteering? We often think of the main big roles that are out there, but we can also be very guilty of, of not looking at, at as much time at the smaller, less pressurized roles, which are often just as important and more accessible for the majority of people, um, which can help out in some ways. So um, one such definition, you might've heard it before, um, is traditional and micro volunteering. So I'll bring that up. Um, so when I break it down, these are a couple of different examples that um, you can see. Sorry, I am just trying to. Uh, there we go. Lost the mouse for a second. So uh, just scrolling through. So when we look at traditional, you've got committees. Um, committees, event organisation, coaching, when we look at specific to, to orienteering. Um, certainly the longer in what is required, so may need a bit of training um, as well um, and carry quite a bit more responsibility. So that responsibility might really enthrall people to get involved, but at the same time it might also scare a few people off um, that are really nervous about being having that um, on them. So. Um, if I just look at club committees, clearly essential for the running of the club uh, and filled by some very dedicated people. Um, and when we look at some meetings, we're certainly not alone in, in some of the lengths of meetings and the time that meetings can take. Um, but do we often set a prior, um, do we send out information prior to the meeting other than an agenda? What can we do to try and maximize the benefit of those meetings and things that can be sent out in advance and i'm sure everyone gets caught 
talking over the, the nice to do things as opposed to the hard questions and challenges clubs will face. Um, I, I know um, Orienteering, obviously maps. Maps are a very big topic um, of discussion, um, uh, and some discussions can last a while. How many to order? But if you sort of sit back and think, how many maps are we going to order for a certain event? Um, you can spend a lot more time on it rather than thinking about what the experience of the event. Um, and how many people actually start their agenda uh, with looking at club development or how we can make the club environment better for the members and the experience is better. Um, that's often right at the end when everybody's tired and wants to go. So it, just having a juggle around occasionally. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, much details of the event organisation and coaching. Um, well, I'm just looking at some of the, uh, the key points that are just written down in some of my notes. Um, it's about processes. What can we do? If you've got if you think about first impressions of somebody, somebody's coming on board to, to help you run an event um, and you say, great, yeah, we've got a support pack for you. And here you go, let us know what you think. And it's over 10 pages long. That, that could quite easily put somebody off. And, and how if you're new, you put yourself into their shoes and, and think, well, am I, am I asking too much? Is it going to scare somebody away? Um, uh, and coaching, how can we encourage more people to help out? So that links into the micro-volunteering. So much more flexible. So Jenny, I think you've put some stats in here about micro-volunteering. I have done. Um, it's kind of, uh, in a way, I pause just because micro-volunteering or ad hoc volunteering has been kind of very much a buzzword in kind of the voluntary sector for a while. And actually, they fall down to often the social media or the things that you could do really, and those small portions but they're a good example it's bite size so actually when the national council of volunteer voluntary organizations did a recent survey actually of those people who didn't currently volunteer um kind of 60 percent of them said they would be willing to volunteer if it was felt that it was kind of a small manageable something that they feel they can do and achieve but also Feel like a long-term commitment until they're ready so in a sense volunteering has historically felt like a little bit like a blank check and i guess i'm possibly too preaching to the converted but i'm sure some of you guys at some point have attended a meeting and then walked out having been elected to a committee role or, or something that you hadn't intended at the start of the evening so actually when we think about different ways of volunteering and trying to get uh, kind of new people to help on take on one actually think about how this micro volunteering is um, and actually it's really possibly again from the ncbo only kind of 7% of people who, who volunteer, in fact, 7% of the population and then who at some point in their life volunteer, do so consistently and through a kind of lifelong habit. So actually in, in sport and a lot of places, a lot of our roles are almost designed for that small 77% of people rather than the 70% of people who say they'd quite like to do things that work with, with their lives and doing other things. I appreciate it's easier said than done, so I really love your thoughts on how your class do do that and actually as Peter said how we make the experience of those who do give their time which is obviously you guys because it's a Thursday night and instead of being out enjoying the, the summer sunshine you're, you're sitting here with us but how do we actually make sure that you have a really positive experience but you feel really supported brilliant I shall uh, we shall move on so uh, so just like some of them uh, some of them pictures on there uh, as well I thought the, uh, the PFO has just done some um, some great events um, to try and get new people in and they've had a great band of volunteers that um, have been sat what could be better in the sun on a tuesday morning outside uh, a cafe speaking to people that were really enthusiastic and loving the sport um and they were just always a smile on their face so um it, it was a really good uh, really good few weeks there uh, but move on so now getting into sort of why we need um volunteers we often hear people saying that we need more, more volunteers to help out, but why? What would they do? Most, most importantly, obviously, who? Um, as a club, it's important to understand the first steps um, and what you want to achieve. And this is where your future development plan uh, needs to have goals and objectives. So you may have a club development plan um, about potentially more events, trying to get more members on board. Um, but then do you obviously then drill down into how we're going to be able to turn that into reality with, with more volunteers as well. Um, or is there a separate section for that? 
Um, and once you've got a, a plan in place and you're looking at your existing volunteers and club members, um, by looking at them, you'd be able to identify gaps and, and see where you need to what you need to fill to achieve your goals. So one of the first steps would be to run a volunteer analysis within your club. Um, you'll probably be quite surprised at the results that come back with the number of members actually probably doing more than you're aware, more than you think, um, especially when you consider uh, the different micro-volunteering uh, we mentioned before. So um, how many people will give up 10 minutes to go, or 10, 15 minutes to go and pick some controls at the end of an event if they're around? Um, they're invaluable um, to be done, but we sometimes do get overlooked, unfortunately. Um, and I saw a really good um, example um, from one club last year where they'd put together um, a spreadsheet, uh, all the club members' names, um, then looked at their ages and then had a column for were they a committee member, what did they do event roles and did they do some, some other roles obviously within the club. Um, and it was really informative to them and it, it showed them what was, uh, what was happening within their, um, within their members. Uh, and, and likewise, if you've got somebody that's that's been around for oh, for, for a long time in the club, and there, there was people that were sort of eighty plus, now clearly you're not going to be asking everybody to be doing um, some of the really hard, hard, time-consuming roles. So there's lots of things to think about properly, but it really did give a good snapshot as to um, who was doing um, what. And certainly, I saw. Um, this one person he started listing down all the roles he did within the club and was knocking on about a dozen. Um, now they're obviously really valuable, but at the same time something's going to have to give at some point there. Um, so let's say sometimes a simple spreadsheet will help you to uh, look uh, moving forward. And my uh, mouse was on the wrong bit, hence that just jumped. Um, so. When you need to look at your current committees, um, how many events to run a year or forecast to run, you'll be then, how many people do you need to get trained into key positions? Um, it's certainly not advisable to have one person doing all of the uh, doing all of them. Um, where are the future gaps? Can you predict, does some, is somebody already told you that they're going to give up uh, the committee? And where is our immediate and future need in various event roles? So understanding who could and most importantly want to volunteer, um, it is key. Not everybody will volunteer and if you go out trying to get everybody you'll probably more lose them to your club rather than keeping them. Um, and certainly there are limits to what juniors can do but at the same time juniors are certainly really keen and want to get involved so how can you harness that interest? So this is thinking about what is your approach within the club and do you actually ask regular um, for support at events? Um, now I'll just mention the, the, the PFO example at um, uh, the Pendle Forest Orienteers, they've got club night example about um, how they've been working with their members to give them more experience about what they've done. So um, Judith, uh, the, the chair lady there, was really kind enough to, to send me this example through and certainly is very key to the cruci and crucial to what PFO want to achieve going forward. And they have a regular club night every week and within this club night they've been organising some very small mini events. Um, and Andy Ellis at the club has, has started introducing the use of the SI kits so that on a club night they can create a short course or train the event is planned um, and different members have had a go um, at inputting information such as registration slips and monitoring the download process uh, and having a go at putting these things together. So at these events all the members regardless of age um, have all had a go. Um, less pressure, well, no pressure, and it's the experience. This has given more people to the experience that have tried something that they might not have tried before. Um, and they're very keen to point out as well, they've had several non orienteers have also had a go and, and said that um, they, even though they don't want to enter an event, they'd be quite happy to do some administration before or, or after the event at the same time. So, um, really good uh, really good example um, and they're actually planning to do something with the the purple pen technology uh, next so um really good yes they run a, a regular uh, club night however it shouldn't put you off um, if you don't run these you could run a series of group training sessions over a month so there's different ways of adapting just because they do it at a club night that that suits them but there will be a way of, of suiting it with your club um I'm going to click on to 
one more slide. So let's get um, onto a poll. Sorry, before I move on to the next one. So another one to uh, give you a chance to uh, to get involved. Um, what motivates you to volunteer? Really, really interesting one, which will hopefully uh, which will link us into uh, the next section. So I've got uh, just as you're answering some questions here. I've had uh, I had a, a quick chat with a few people prior to um, to this evening as well, and some answers uh, why they volunteers parental responsibility they turned up at a training session one coach for 40 40 people so they gave um gave some help there giving opportunities to others um learning not a lot of new skills these are all quotes these are not ones i've made up these are all people that have uh, what they've said to me so helping the club improving the cv enjoy the social aspect it's lots of um lots of really good ways and, and um of getting through enjoyment being in charge, something like you know, it, it does uh, it does help, and that didn't come up very often, but you know, it is one that uh, was quite popular, um, or one that I did that I thought was uh, was interesting to throw out there. But uh, I think we've had the uh, majority of people vote, so I will close that now. Um, let's share the results. Fifty-six percent wanting to give something back to others, and thirty. Uh, 36 obviously enjoy it and uh, oh there's a nine you wanted uh, you want or you wanted to learn a new skill and um, really interesting ones uh, that are there to see and I think we'll, uh, we'll link us nicely into uh, the next section so I will um, I am just gonna hand over control uh, the dashboard um, okay so I should now be able to move the slide forward I will. <laughs> if it is right, that should uh, it should all work. You should be able to change that now. Mm. I don't want to press too many times because in the test earlier, it then span ahead really quickly. Yes, it did. <laughs> I can uh, have a look. Uh, I can see something happening. You sure? Yeah. Or I can just click through. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, go for that, you know. I, I think That's as a guest, I can be trusted with the controls. <laughs> there we go. So, um, ah, fantastic. And uh, apologies, I'm trying to work out how small your screens might be at, at home. But this is a quick bar chart from a survey we recently did with um, over 2,000 current and former sports volunteers. And um, as you probably wouldn't be surprised by any of this. Um, that actually the biggest column on the left hand side was because they were already involved in that sport, they were already participating and playing through it. And we're going to come back to this one because this is a massive strength for sport, but also potentially uh, something we just need to be aware of uh, when we try and bring people in. Then, effectively, if you took out that first dark blue column, what you then have left over the thing actually mirrors why people volunteer in any part of that lives, whether that's through their faith group, whether that's through volunteering at the local library, with um, any kind of civic society group or any national charity. These are very similar because what comes up really strongly is I would like to improve things or help people. I would like to make a difference. I would like to use a chance of using my existing skills or also learning skills and actually there's a, a lot around kind of make that kind of really tangible impact and using your skills for that impact, but also enjoyment, friendship, social side, really, really important. And just as an aside, actually, when you ask people about their motivations to volunteer and then you ask them what keeps them volunteering, things subtly shift and actually the enjoyment and the social side comes through really strongly about why they keep doing it, but also that need of being able to see the impact of how they've made that difference. And I think this is a real reflection on kind of where people are in their lives and probably, you know, giving your time is a really valuable asset. You know, if you think of all the work that charities do around supporting their donors who give them money or, you know, through fundraising, if we think of people who give their time, it's so much more than that. So being able to give them a great experience, but also showing them the impact they have uh, is really important. So if you want to just click one more click, Peter, mm -hmm. then it should. Yeah. So for us, some really big things to pull up actually having a connection to the participation is really really strong and it's a little bit of a no-brainer 
So, of course, you know, people who tend to volunteer and volunteer and have a connection to volunteer, whether that's because they're currently active in the sport, or whether actually by volunteering, it helps them stay connected with sport they used to be able to be more active in. And that's a, an important shift that we'll look at a little bit more when we understand about kind of life stage. Um, being able to make a difference, huge one. And I guess this comes back to a bit later on, when we talk a bit more strategically as a club, how do you consistently be able to give that feedback loop and tell people how they're helping and make a difference? And this comes with kind of thanks, I guess reward in its broader sense and recognition, but also we know it must feed back that original motivation because if you want to make a difference and yet you're not potentially being told how it's making an impact or not being able to see it, then actually you're going to lose that motivation and potentially stop giving your time. Um, skills, which is also really linked to the above, it's about feeling a sense of agency, a sense of kind of impact that's down to you bringing something that's added value. And that shouldn't be split out into people who are using their existing skills or people who want to develop their skills. I often think that when people talk about recruiting young people to volunteer, it almost feels like the young people want to be transactionary. I want to learn skills. And actually, it's almost a bit sniffed at in kind of wider voluntary circles, but actually it's not. We want to help young people develop the skills, which we know sport is a really powerful driver of that. Things like leadership, responsibility, you know, planning, I think that kind of shouts out with your sport particularly. You know, these are really great skills, but it's a real mutual relationship. Um, so there's that. And then really importantly, and we will come back to it, it's the families, friends and the social side, which you'll see is actually consistently across the board. You know, a quarter of people at only one time think that that's a real big driver for them. So the, the importance of looking at why is kind of twofold. Um, so first of all, it's around actually understanding why someone's giving their time so that you can help as a club to help fulfill that so that they have a really good experience and so that they stay giving their time. Um, the second bit is kind of a bit more um, layered. So it's how us as a, a, a kind of sporting sector and you guys as a club level, how do you help use that motivation to actually create that narrative around your club. A little bit like Carol mentioned, I think it was Carol mentioned early on, that actually volunteering becomes the norm. You know, there's loads of organisations, I'm sure we're all part of, where actually it's just normal to give your time and help out. And how do we create that in a sense of kind of at your club so that it becomes not something that's only a small core of people, but actually something everyone does and everyone is expected to do. And actually through sharing these stories, you're saying, oh, actually, so and so is doing it because they wanted to make a difference or they're using their skills or whatever. That's like me, I could, I could do that. So we'll come back to communications, in fact, Peter will later, but why it's so important to share these stories. So that's me, Peter, back to you. Uh, yeah, no, was, uh, Rob's just uh, agreed with you there as well about 100% uh, for uni and college students. Volunteering is key for experience uh, and to stand out from the rest of the class. Yeah, and sport's a really powerful thing to this, you know, have, you know, at a really young age, sport actually really trusts young people and there's loads of sectors that don't trust them. They don't trust them to make decisions or help out or get involved or, you know, support the coach or whatever. And actually, this is a real strength from our part. So you're absolutely right. It's a really, really interesting dynamic for us. Uh, moving on. So why do people volunteer? Um, many different, obviously, reasons why. Um, and the key is understanding the individual. Um, primarily, why do most volunteer in sport and within or um, within orienteering? Well, it's uh, it's the, the sport itself, um, which is great. And uh, you know from personal experience, everybody obviously in watching this, uh, there'll always be a few people that will just get involved quite easily. Um, but to take their volunteering experience to the next level, um, it's really important to understand obviously a couple of, uh, of key areas as well. So. Um, what's their backstory, what are their skills away from orienteering, being aware and understanding what their restrictions are, um, what's their personality as well. I'm always going, um, the, the outgoing person, there's always somebody in the club that you know that will just talk forever and really bubbly personality and such like that. And they would be ideal for, for meeting new people, trying not as long as they're not too much in, in the face um, at the same time, but the enthusiasm that they can bring can really capture somebody that's new, that's come down for the first time um, and could capture them and keep them at the club for a, for a good period of time. Um, 
and we just can't understand or underestimate um, these different areas and knowing your volunteers better because um, it will not only provide them a better experience but you as a club will only benefit so uh, I'll pass it on to pass it back to Jenny to, to carry on and just a quick summary on that bit. Yeah don't actually pass me the controls I can't be fussed with it but if you can flick on to the next slide that'd be yep. grand. There we go you don't want the arrow yet. <laughs> not yet you would surprise me to. Um, so this is um, another piece or a part of the research I just mentioned where effectively we were looking at at what stage in people's lives do they um, do our current sports volunteers come from and actually I guess I'd, I'd be interested to see if you find this surprising or not in a sense this is about as Peter said understanding the individual and actually where they're at and what they can do and this falls into what type of experience and role that might be appropriate for them or they might be interested in but also then if we take a little bit more of a strategic view actually are there particular entry points or opportunities that as a club you can actually build on um, so do you want to go for my hours now peter do you want to just click i think there's five of them oh yeah <laughs> yeah you keep clicking i'll talk to it so <laughs> in a sense um it probably doesn't surprise you that a significant cohort of sports volunteers are amongst that younger age group which is 16 to 24 so again i think rob's last comment touched on it but actually this is a, a really positive uh group for us however we also know that actually as they kind of head off after university usually or head, you know from your point of view you might be heading from a local club onto college or university and then subsequently after university there's actually it drops and this is an appreciation of just where people are in their lives they're often moving to a new area trying to uh, new jobs, trying to impress the boss, staying late, all this kind of stuff, or actually just haven't made that local connection to a, to a club. So again, maybe as us as a sports sector need to think about what are the things that actually we can do to encourage young people whilst they're in this age group that does volunteer and give their time, but also around sustainability and just succession planning, think they're not going to be here forever. Um, but interestingly, we also know from this data that if you volunteer whilst you're younger, in fact as young as 10, in some ways helping, having this habit of helping out, you're far more likely to volunteer throughout the rest of your life when the opportunities are right for you. So in that sense, it's almost worth investing in, in young people to create that habit. Also really interestingly, the sports that you play and enjoy when you're younger, you're more likely to, as we'll come back to, return to and often introduce your children to. So again, you know, this could be a really important group for the, the future of volunteering. Um, and then as we head kind of into kind of 20s and early 30s, people's lives are busy and different. And actually we find that they don't tend to volunteer as much. And this is not just in sport, this is across the board. Um, then we get a really interesting age group, which is if you kind of imagine the parenthood age group. And this is across lots of sports that actually, when they become parents, they often take and, and not to generalise, but it's a significant majority, it's often the dads take their children um, in, and back in and introduce them to the sport that they, they loved and was part of, and actually they as parents then help. So we see a big uptick in dads um, taking more coaching roles. We often see a lot more of, kind of mums getting involved, even if they hadn't been active in that sport. Um, and I'll give you quite a nice example that on Sunday morning, just gone, I took my daughter to a first kind of organised session of a new, new sport locally to us. And it was all about getting the parents on pitch. You know, it wasn't just at the end, play about with your, you know, kick the ball or catch the ball with your, your child at the end of the session. It was actually the aim of the session was to keep the parents involved for as long as possible. However, I've done an up and down arrow here just because it's a real appreciation that this group actually tends to be a bit squeezed. They tend to be kind of time poor. Their motivation is their kids, which is a real positive, but also their motivation of their kids. So it's about kind of roles that help create that positive impact. They potentially might also have older parents looking after, you know, they potentially are working full time. So it's actually a real squeezed group. So it's about understanding what might be the right opportunities for them at that time. Also, you have a number of sports like swimming, who when they look at their volunteers are seeing a real defined cohort of parents <coughs> volunteering for three or four years. And then when the child finishes that particular swim program or, you know, children hit teenage years and, you know, perhaps don't become as interested or whatever, and that's when the parents stop. And so actually, we've got to appreciate the opportunity points coming in, great, but also understand and do succession planning that when people leave. And when people leave, it's, it is sad, but actually it's not the end of the world because actually their lives are going on and doing other things. We then see an uptick 
um, almost kind of for that later bit when people potentially have more time. And we see often that age group wanting to give back around their, using their own skills um, and stay connected with a sport that has effectively given to them. And then as we see a kind of a ta tailoring off as people get older, so they might have more time, but actually, um, if you're anything like my parents-in-law who are retired, they're the busiest people I know, but actually there's still other calls on their time, potentially looking after grandchildren and others. And just think about those types of roles. And if you've been volunteering throughout all of that, you're going to be hitting that stage where you think, I've been doing it a while, and I've probably accumulated loads of roles and add on kind of responsibilities. So again, I think just as us, as a sector in the work that I do, kind of working with big partners, but also you guys at club level, just understanding that life cycle and thinking what really works for those individuals and what are the opportunities that we as a club could actually uh, bring on. So I'm just going to give two quick examples because I'm aware of the time. Um, so first one uh, is uh, cricket. I appreciate it's a big sport, but the ECB have invested a lot in their kids and parents programmes and trying to utilise the kids programmes to get the parents involved. They've also realised that they were losing um, to predominantly uh, boys around that kind of early teen year where you moved from the juniors to the adults and they just weren't getting the gameplay or the kind of engagement that they had in the youth programs and so they've now invented a whole new kind of participant element with the t20s under 19s and the whole of that organization of it the volunteer run is by the young people themselves they've almost said to the local clubs you know let, let the kids try it and they're doing all kinds of different things and the young people themselves are running all the fixtures all the events around it so that is very much a volunteer program alongside the participation and i guess another example is netball where they've developed around walking netball they've built up a partnership with the wi so actually they're using the, the volunteers and the women in the wi to build on those individual motivations of trying to be active being really sociable um, and actually creating volunteer roles around that so that netball can happen so it's just kind of tying in those different things. So I think that's me. Yeah. Have just, uh, out? Yeah, that, there has been a question come through, and uh, just as I'm about to say it, it's uh, it's now flashed up that Carol's just gone offline. So uh, <laughs> it's a hope that he uh, hasn't. Uh, obviously, the internet connection uh, might have just dropped for a second, but. Um, She's just highlighting that she believes that um, obviously very different volunteer profile within um, orienteering and um, where it's a case of orienteering, everybody takes part um, and it's not like many other sports where uh, it's mainly the children um, and also they have a, a, a massive volunteer input from the, the 55 to, to 85 year old participants. Um, certainly do, yeah. Um, and it's great to see people um, and, and that with the experience that they've got and um, still being able to give into the sport um, and that obviously is massive. Ah great Carol, you, you, your offline's flashed off so you're back online now hopefully um, as, as we're looking through but um, and then that's certainly with, with Phil Conway and, and with the youth strategy and, uh, and as clubs expand the, the youth side we can look into tapping into some of the, the, the parent aspects and um, I think it's a real positive to see that when everybody does come to events, um, we see full families getting involved and that should be embraced and, and how we can get, but we are different to obviously to say something like football where you, your team sports, where you turn up before the, the players prepare, uh, prepare, then they play the game and then you've got the, the cool down afterwards. Um, whereas you could go out and do your event for your run for half an hour, come back, but the events spanned over a couple of hours. So there are different elements in it, how you, how you can adapt that so that, that people can can give half an hour or uh, and during that that event so i think there's different things that we can work on uh, at the same time to know your own your own club and your own sports really better i mean whilst the work we do which is kind of cutting across the sector is really good for best practice sharing actually what really comes is you guys know your sport and your volunteers best and actually by engaging with them you you'll probably actually have some really great stuff that you involve your 55 or 85 year olds on that actually other sports would benefit from because actually they can't quite think of things that would really fit into their lifetime life cycle so you know it'd be it's great that you know your sport best so well uh click we'll move on to uh, this was another question that had come in prior to tonight um so does anyone know about research that's been done in orienteering about the volunteer effort um so uh, particularly establishing typical volunteering effort that goes into all the elements uh, of orienteering, such as mapping, planning, 
controlling and organising. Um, and then, of course, I'm just running the event on the day. So um, we feel that this is where is, if they have such data, they're able to establish where the greatest potential is for reducing volunteer effort uh, and increasing efficiency, um, as well as reducing the stress and pressures on volunteers as they do their work. Now, hopefully we've we, we've touched on, onto some of that as we've um, as we've gone through. There isn't any particular data, um, certainly within orienteering, that we've got on this. I don't think there's anything general, is there, uh, Jenny, on that one? Data about how much time and effort people, some volunteers are putting in in certain sports? Um, so a couple of the bigger sports um, are doing this themselves, so you wouldn't be surprised to hear that the FA has research about this. And interestingly, um, they work out that their volunteers or their core of volunteers actually give as much hours uh, as the equivalent of, you know, your son John's ambulance volunteers or your Samaritan's volunteers. So actually they're really clocking up. But what they've used that information for is to understand what they spend their time on. And they realise a lot of it is the admin and the logistics that's kind of off pitch. And actually this is where when you match up to the original motivations, they some of the, you know, their realisation that they don't, can't move too far that way around admin and organisation and process that actually loses the motivation for doing it. So they're actually looking at ways that they can reduce that so that actually the volunteers spend their time doing what you know they originally wanted to do. Um, but again, I think more broadly in the voluntary sector, it's an appreciation of are there opportunities to share workloads or utilise technology um, that actually helps kind of reduce that. But also, I guess, as it comes back to you guys, how do you feel that, you know, as a club, you can support people so that they're not... Um, feeling stressed or pressured because by its very nature, as soon as volunteering starts to feel like a day job, that's when people start start stop volunteering. So it's really important. Yeah, and, and this was something. Uh, this was a question I asked um, in in our office as well. Um, came through just to get some uh, some thoughts on it as well. Um, and it is about understanding the basic event structure and and empowering people at the same time. So if they're in a role and doing things but then they've got to keep checking back with the committee or, or lead organizer how much time that builds in it's another hurdle so it's about empowering um so you, you can trust the different individuals to make decisions if you're if you're planning um, or organizing different events um or, or giving the experience before by all means yes somebody at the end of the phone as well but it's just something else that you could uh, reduce which will reduce the uh, the time effort in, in that respect all right, so let's uh, look on to what clubs can do. Uh, so, shall I pass this one to you? Do you want to take a lead on this one, Jenny? Oh, okay, perfect. Um, I'll throw this one to you. <laughs> well, this is my favourite photo, um, and I absolutely love it. Um, and actually, it kind of shows the sheer, sheer joy that volunteering can bring. Um, I think a couple of things that clubs can do around kind of overarching behaviours and principles. And again, as Peter almost started the webinar by saying there's no silver bullet in volunteering because so much of it is common sense and how we as individuals and you know groups and the community want to engage with people. So it's about creating a really positive climate and making your volunteers feel valued. So you know, I'm sure you get loads of analogies like the park run thanking their volunteers at the start when everyone's there and, and waiting. It's around kind of giving shout outs to your volunteers. Interestingly, um, a again, another of the large sports asked a survey amongst their volunteers about who would you like to be thanked or recognised by, uh, right down from your celebrity, you know, A-list kind of uh, sports players, right the way down to kind of everyone imaginable. And the answer was definitely not them, definitely not, with no disrespect to anyone from head office or the, the, the national government body. Actually, they wanted to be thanked and recognised, often by the participants, uh, parents, although I appreciate your point, you might not have so many uh, parents involved, and actually fellow fellow members and volunteers, and it ne was never a reward style thing, it was just the thanks. So kind of behaviours and things is around creating that sense of being valued. Um, give your volunteers ownership. Peter just said it really well. It's actually about kind of trusting and empowering people and just having a sense that, you know, we, you're giving your time and your skills. We trust you to do that to your, to your best effort, but we're here if you need any help. And creating a positive um, culture, which is a bit on Carol's point that she started right off. It's about actually making sure it's really normal to volunteer. You know, this sense of actually people when they list it, you know, who am I? I'm a, I'm, 
employee, a mum, a sister, that, you know, I'm a volunteer, it's part of who I am, and actually therefore it's part of your club. And this is why sports clubs are so powerful and dynamic compared to more transactional sport, where you go and swipe your card in at the gym and you do your thing. Actually, that positive culture is a really important thing for it, particularly because it keeps people coming back. Um, and then you'd be really remiss not to talk about strategic and succession planning, because actually, as a club, you need to take that kind of bigger view of how from how you help the individuals to how actually as a club we can do this. So it is that constant ask. It's everyone in the club asking for other people to help out or join in or volunteer. So it's not just somebody's role. It's not just me constantly asking. It's, it's this whole atmosphere that everybody asks. Um, and succession planning, you know, it's, it's a bit of no brain and I know Peter's going to come on to this next. But also just briefly touch on about being outward looking. And I'm sure many of you are. It's about being connected to your local community. And actually using your members who are bound to be, you know, that you're about to have a fair share of your school governors, your, you know, people who are members of the local church, people who are involved in, you know, local campaign groups, you know, other charities, actually be really connected and see kind of what where those conversations could could lead, whether that's more people coming in and trying it, or just actually being creating that culture that your club is really embedded in your community. Um, so they're kind of overarching behaviours, and I'll pass back to you, Peter. No, it's right. So now it's looking at, at, at what can clubs do. Um, I've just put everything up there to start with. But things like, do you have um, a volunteering handbook? Um, don't get the impression that everyone should suddenly go out and start creating this 50-page document that says every role that you do within your club. Um, but it, 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 it doesn't and shouldn't be a massive document. But Anything that's easily accessible and provides a good understanding for someone to pick it up and give it a go will always be beneficial. Um, and, and does volunteer have a prominent place on your website? Um, so are the different roles that, that members can do, is it publicly there for people to have a look at and see it and understand? Um, I've had a look through quite a few different websites across different sports and it's very hard to find it very obvious where you can do things so um it, it's just a simple thing of, of putting putting some more profile on there raising the profile there so um if you do have a, a specific page on your website that you'd be able to you'd want to share then obviously do do let us know and we can we can share that out there as well but it, it's looking through facebook um twitter whatsapp think about participation impact fundraising volunteering there's lots of different things where you can have an impact and um again I've, I've put a few clubs on the spot recently when i've been out about and, uh, and said what is your what's your your call to action if you were to ask volunteers and, and why and there's not been many that have uh, that they've been able to say straight away now it's just having to think about what what we want to achieve so um about highlighting positive experiences how can you you do that through um, through your newsletters, through email communications, websites. We've put it on the on the slide there, saying thank you and recognition. It's not all about um, having reward and recognition. Um, people have told us themselves they're not in it for reward, but the thank yous go a massive way. So there, I'll let the picture on there. Let's just celebrate who's involved, what people are doing, and um, we talk about what. I uh, see lots of newsletters and, and some really positive stories about members within the clubs of, of ages right across the spectrum um, and what they've achieved at different events. Well, why are we not shouting about the um, the organisers and the planners and um, uh, that are getting involved and putting on these essential events? If it's somebody's first event, then let's, let's really make a, a big thing about how well they've done. Um, on that front um, and it's all about as well it's, it's how you support we've touched about um, website resources and adv uh, advice and making sure we're not doing ridiculously long documents um, that, that put people off at the same time it can be a simple checklist um, but how do we also try and break down roles at the same time so there's a, a, full, a full different range of, of, of things that you can do um, we just need to make sure that we give it enough attention and, and raise the awareness within the club um, as to what it is and, and the opportunities that are there. People not do something if they don't know it's there or they've never been asked um, and that's half the hurdle. If you ask somebody, um, 
they will go they will uh, no doubt try and, and help it out somebody came into uh, saw somebody the other week that had just been trying understanding what orienteering was about and the first thing they said was how friendly volunteers were within the uh, orienteering community and how willing they were to help out um it was really good and actually going back to another um uh, pendle forest example at the club night i thought it was really good they had their club night and at the end of the club night it's tea and biscuits and chatting for half an hour afterwards uh, and this they get most of their volunteers um a good chunk certainly from that interaction and um, it's a casual, great way of, of speaking to people. Um, did you want to add about the Club Matters um, workshops? Um, I did just, um, if you don't know about Club Matters, which is a Sport England uh, linked website, which supports kind of um, clubs. It's usually a lot around kind of business planning and um, kind, of, kind of planning details, but there's also a section there on volunteers, volunteer best practice, some uh, template role descriptions and, and kind of surveys, but also, um, the um, uh, partner we work with through that also do some volunteer experience um, workshops, uh, both online and in person. So if that's something that interests you to take it further, then the resources are there. Um, I was also just going to say a little bit on your point there, Peter, about um, kind of making it being so friendly and being recognised for being friendly. I was talking to a, um, a, a sports club recently and they'd done a how how did you get involved kind of questionnaire to their, their volunteers? And most people answered, oh, you know, I was asked directly, which you guys were. And they then went the next step further and said, okay, who asked you? And it turned out that pretty much 80% of their existing volunteers were asked by one person. And they suddenly realized it was, it was a woman called Sue. And she was a general volunteer help router, but she was the only one who was kind of asking and advocating. And they realized actually she was the most important person in the club, but they needed more of her. So actually, it was quite it was quite a nice story to hear that how they kind of at last you know recognised that all she had done um, and all her great work. So you're quite right. There's there's small ways that you can do this. Yeah, and just because of time at the minute, we've got one more quick poll. So I'll lead it up for thirty seconds. I've just got that teed up, but uh, it is re a really important one as well for uh, you to if we can get your your answers on this one. So as a volunteer, what would improve your experience and help you more? Um, so more resources club website, resources on the British Orienteering website, uh, simpler processes, you can answer multiple times um, on here as well. Um, central resource hub, um, reduced administration, so you can answer say, more, more than once, plenty of uh, answers coming through at the moment. Um, I'll give it another few seconds because all the, the numbers keep changing right before my own eyes at the minute. Um, one clear. That was a couple of really tight ones as well. Right, I'll give you those. Right, I'm going to close that one. So apologies if you've not had a chance uh, to uh, answer, but I'll share the uh, the results through there. So interesting, simpler processes and a central hub, um, central resource hub within the club. It's a good point. Um, reduced administration. Um, some similar ones there, but uh, uh, interesting ones which we can uh, reflect on uh, as well later on. So we shall uh, move on to communication. So, let's uh, just hide the poll, it would help. Um, looking at what are the best ways to communicate? We've, we've touched on the word of mouth being a, a massive one um, and that's a lot of results as backed up by the poll earlier as well about how people get involved. Um, but it's key, it's like advertising to new members, first impressions can often dictate how, whether you will see them again. Um, and it doesn't go with, it goes without saying about expect, treat others how you'd expect to be treated. Um, but we need to make make sure that word of mouth is being done to speak to other people. We ensure our social media pages are up to date. It's a very important tool that um, make it clear we're looking for people. Do we um, Do we often say, you know, these are the opportunities? Um, even if you don't need anybody, but we, you can still keep pushing things forward. We talked about profile um, with newsletters, emails, regular positive articles about how somebody's enjoyed the sport at, at your event and the impact that your guys have um, you know, have had. Um, if you 
if you've an event poster, why not feature the volunteering opportunities that are there as well? What are the different skills that you can do? How can you can adapt to that poster? Um, so it's just sort of the, the traditional methods, like posters at events. Um, it may be something that's been done for years, the posters, but it still works. Um, and we don't mean having a small A5 poster that's tucked at the back of the tent where you're registering to go on your event. Um, why not get something that's that's A3 size or even a, a plastic banner that you can use over and over again that not only advertises your event, but advertises that other people you know, can get involved and you try and speak to your members that way. Um, so if you're new into the sport, would you actually think that I could do all these roles? You might just turn up and see people at registration desk, see people doing lots of other things, but you won't. Will you automatically think that that's something you could do? You might be interested in it, but it's not going to be a natural assumption. So um, it, it's how we communicate what there is, and, and that is a communication, whatever it is, whether it's volunteering or events, is, is, is massive. Um, I will, I think, is there anything to add before we, uh, we conclude? I think. I think that was, uh, yeah. So, some actions and um, recommendations. If you do have any questions, um, do get them in now. Um, we're going to, uh, we're just on the last couple of minutes. So, last chance to, to get some through there. Uh, Rob's just asked one there about uh, just picking up on Jenny's point. Um, also, people feel valued if they're asked to help. Um, I can, nothing to add on that one. I think that says everything. <laughs> um, uh, thanks, Rob, for that one. Um, so, some of the key points that we've talked about um, this evening in a, uh, as we've gone through. So, the club, club volunteer analysis, um, understanding the best ways to communicate with your members. Um, it might not be through social media, it might be through different channels, it might be even whatever is best with your members, you'll know your members best. Um, and then how can you expand your reach outside of clubs, um, not mentioned earlier actually. Um, there's lots of volunteer networks outside of orienteering that you can tap into in local authorities. Um, uh, the Greater Manchester one. Um, in greater sport, we're talking about how many thousands of volunteers they've got on um, on their list. So it's thinking: can we can we look into these these groups of these people that we can then um, utilise it and give opportunities um, within within orienteering? There's lots of very important roles um, and lots of very key people out there keen to volunteer. So it's not looking inwardly as well. Um, and then looking a, a key one is the support network that's there whether that's documents, whether that's your guide on your website, um, and making sure there are people within the club that are willing to be able to see, them. yeah, ah, I'm quite happy to be a mentor um, to these different roles. So if, if other people are doing these particular roles, I'm always there at the end of the phone to uh, to speak to if they need me. Um, uh, and it, it's great to see how, um, I'll use the example, at Sealock at South East Lancashire, um, where, several Saturday events um, and the people planning the events and then sending them to to other experienced mappers as well to then just double check that what they've done is right and um, again it, it's not criticizing anybody it's just double checking and making sure everyone's doing the right sort of learning so the experience is great for those enjoying the sport and uh, Jenny have you got any 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 closing thoughts before we uh, before we sign off um, no, I just obviously want to um, say thank you. Huge thanks for letting me be part of this. I'm genuinely honoured. I do miss kind of talking to, to volunteers in my, in my day job. It's no disrespect to you, Peter, but I often speak to uh, volunteer staff and volunteer managers, which although is lovely, I, I do miss it. So I, I have really appreciated it. It's obviously brought back lots of fond memories and uh, funny enough, just before the webinar, Googling volunteer events near me. So, uh, you know, I do really appreciate you, you sharing your time with me. Brilliant. Thank you very much for your time, Jenny, and thanks everyone for uh, getting in touch. I've put our uh, email addresses on there should you uh, want to get in touch with us direct to ask any further questions. Um, you will get an email from us um, that will come in the next hour or so, um, and it will have a link with the, this session as well. Uh, my email address if you want to watch things back as well, and obviously by all means, uh, and do get in touch. Um, 
Well, thank you once again. Um, some comments just coming through now. Just obviously thanks for the session. Uh, appreciate all your questions that have come in, and um, and we will see you again. There's a couple of sessions on there. The next one's coming up. Just a quick plug for uh, June of um, participant focused events, and then we've got Purple Pen, which has been a popular one, which um, been requested by uh, everyone to understand uh, that technology as well. So, a couple of good sessions uh, planned in over the next couple of months. Thank you very much. And uh, good evening. Brilliant. See you. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. bye, -bye.